Chapter Seven of The Dogs of Boytown by Walter A. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: Some Other Dogs, Including Rags. It was sympathy for Jack Whipple and interest in the sickness and recovering of Remus that resulted in the formation of a sort of Freemasonry of dog lovers among the boys of Boytown. It had always been known that some of the boys had dogs, and there had been a good deal of fun with these dogs at different times in the past. But hitherto the dogs had been, in a way, taken for granted, and had lived in a sort of background in the boy life of the town. Suddenly they came to light as important members of the community, and each dog had its boy companion. While Romulus and Remus were sick, the Whipple boys often had to answer inquiries as to their progress, but Ernest and Jack had been so wrapped up in their own worries that they did not realize the widespread sympathy that had sprung up. They did not know that a dozen other boys each loved a dog much as they loved Romulus and Remus, and could understand what it must mean to watch at the bedside of a seriously sick puppy. But when Romulus was well on the road to perfect health again, and Remus was slowly convalescing, the other boy dog lovers of the town began to drop around, sometimes with offerings to be appreciated by dogs, just as neighbors bring in jellies and fruit when a person is recovering from a long illness. Then Ernest and Jack began to realize how many friends they had in Boy Town, and that they all had a precious possession in common. Harry Barton came first with Mike. His manner was subdued, and he did not brag. He stepped softly as one would in entering a sick room, and he patted Remus' little head very gently and called him poor little Mutsy. Then came Theron Hammond, though he left his Boston Terrier at home, because Alert had never had distemper and might catch it. He and the Whipple boys sat for a long time in the stable doorway and speculated about the knowingness of dogs. Monty Hubbard came, too. He left his Irish terrier, Mr. O'Brien, at home because of said Mr. O'Brien's well-known proclivity to fight with anything in the shape of a dog, though Monty was sure he wouldn't hurt two sick puppies. But Herbie Pearson honored Rome by bringing his huge brindled Great Dane, Hamlet, who regarded the setters with fatherly indulgence, and then walked off in his stately manner and crouched like a noble statue beside the front gate. And last of all came Rags and Jimmy Rogers, of whom I will presently tell you more. Boytown had always been a great place for dogs, not only the aristocrats of dogdom, living comfortably in homes with loving masters and mistresses, but all sorts of nondescript dogs, many of whom seemed to be masterless and homeless, though not invariably unhappy. In fact, there were many good citizens of Boytown who did not like dogs, and who felt that the canine population of the place was altogether too large. There were restrictive laws that ought to have reduced this canine population to such dogs as were properly owned and licensed, but the government of Boytown was criticized as being a happy-go-lucky affair a good deal of the time, and it was only when complaints became sufficiently numerous and serious that the town fathers took steps to enforce the laws and abolish what was conceded to be a public nuisance. Then a dog catcher was hired, warnings were posted, and the stray dogs were gathered up and mysteriously disposed of. It was rather a cruel and heart-rending business, if you stop to think of it, and it would not have been necessary if the authorities had been more uniformly strict in observing the statutes and ordinances, but that was their way. It was during one of the periods of laxity that a wire-haired terrier appeared from no one knew where. He was not an authentic representative of any of the established breeds, it was quite evident that he had just happened somehow, but he was conspicuous among his miscellaneous black and white and brown and brindled brethren by reason of his superior alertness and intelligence and his never-failing good humor and high spirits. His tramp life had in no way damaged his disposition. He seemed to have been born full of joy of life. He was about the size of one of Mr. Hartshorn's smaller Airedales, and in the main he was not badly formed, but his tail, which had never been docked, hung at a rakish angle to one side, and one ear was set higher than the other. 
his eyes were extraordinarily bright and his wiry coat was a grizzled black always tousled and generally dirty the boys were not long in making this stranger's acquaintance indeed he made the first advances joining in their sport one day when they were in swimming in the pond over by the brickyard and mingling his joyous barks with the shrieks of laughter which his antics provoked he would pick them up on their way to school or anywhere and make himself generally companionable and it was not long before they discovered him to be most precocious in the learning of tricks it was not in the nature of things that such a dog should remain forever masterless but the periodical cleaning up of the dog catcher had begun before any one had had time to think of him as anything but everybody's dog it was jimmy rogers who saw him seized and thrust unceremoniously into the dog catcher's covered wagon and it was jimmy who set out alone to achieve his rescue jimmy's people lived on sharon street and were not well to do but somehow jimmy managed to scrape together the five dollars which he found must be paid before he could establish his claim to ownership after that by common consent he became jimmy rogers dog he had already won the name of rags so jimmy brought his beloved rags to visit the invalids and romulus and remus looked on with big-eyed amazement while rags was made to sit up shake hands roll over chase his tail play dead and sing but there was one boy with a dog who did not come to visit the sick and ernest and jack whipple were not sorry they did not like dick wheaton and dick it was easy to believe was not one to care whether another boy's dog died or not he was a good deal of a bully at school and jack feared and avoided him as for the older boys they found him generally unamiable and those of them who knew the love of dogs were angry with dick for the way he treated poor little jip jip was a smooth-coated fox terrier and a very good specimen of his breed he was smart and gamey but his spirit had nearly been broken by his tyrannical master dick seemed unable to resist the temptation to bully everything smaller and weaker than himself and when there were no small boys or little girls within his reach he indulged his proclivities by teasing his dog jip who had never had any other master did not think of resenting this he merely endured it as best he might in fact there was no more obedient dog in boytown it was pitiful to see the way in which he would answer his master's lightest word as though he lived constantly in the hope of winning favor by his promptness boys often like to tease animals but they are seldom actually cruel at least not knowingly so and when a boy becomes possessed of a dog or a pony of his own his attitude often undergoes a marked change but no relenting took place in dick wheaton's nature and the other boys who had learned the lesson of kindness recognizing his right to do as he chose with his own could only look on with growing disapproval and dislike but all the other dog-owning boys of the town found their friendships growing closer in the warmth of this common interest during the convalescence of remus they made rome a sort of lodge room for the meetings of a new association with an unwritten constitution and no bylaws. they talked much of dogs and it was not long before a number of them were keenly desirous of visiting willowdale and making the acquaintance of dog-wise tom poultice the rich mr hartshorn and all the Aradales and white bull terriers so harry barton made the arrangements and one saturday in may an expedition was formed to walk to thornborough and visit willowdale there were seven boys in the company and three dogs mike alert and rags romulus and remus were not yet strong enough to make such a trip and it was voted that these three could be counted upon to behave themselves properly there was a little doubt about rags but he was a general favorite and was always given the benefit of any doubt at the last moment herbie pearson and hamlet joined the excursion to these active boys and their dogs the way did not seem too long in fact rags full of joyful exuberance at this rare treat dashed about on all sorts of secondary adventures running three miles to every one traversed even sturdy little alert in spite of his short legs 
took it all as a lark and did not think to be weary until he reached home that afternoon and fell sound asleep on his front door mat the arrival of the four canine strangers at Willowdale created a good deal of commotion in the Finston runs, and Rags nearly went crazy with the excitement. But Tom Poultice took it all good-naturedly, and when he had got things quieted down a little, he took the boys through the kennels and introduced them to the prize dogs. They were all so absorbed in this pleasant occupation that it was noon before they knew it, and Mrs. Hartshorn came out to invite them all up to the porch for a luncheon as they were following her up to the house she asked questions about their four dogs and appeared to take a great interest and in alert especially he's really a very fine little dog she said but who is this rags had come up and thrust his cold nose ingratiatingly into her hand oh that's rags they said and interrupted each other with explanations mrs hartshorn laughed well i would hardly know what to call him she said but he is evidently a very popular person but what's the matter with his back oh it just itches said jimmy there was a spot on rags back that was difficult for him to reach and it gave him a good deal of trouble but he had managed to bite a good deal of the hair out of it beneath mrs hartshorn discovered the skin to be in a scabby and unhealthy condition well said she this shouldn't be neglected it may be mange and that's serious let's have tom look at it tom came up at her bidding and examined rags back do you think it's mange tom asked mrs hartshorn i don't think so said he it looks like eczema like the harrodales had last summer he'd better have some of that medicine i fancy all right said mrs hartshorn i still have some at the house i think that i got in case my dog should need it eczema she explained to the boys isn't exactly a skin disease it is caused by the dog's general condition and should be treated internally though if you will rub zinc ointment on that spot it will heal more rapidly the cure is first a good dose of sulphur and cream of tartar you can get that in tablet form at the drug store then give him the pills i am going to get for you they are a tonic and ought to fix him up all right only be sure not to feed him any cornmeal warned tom that's so said mrs hartshorn especially now that warm weather is coming before the boys left that afternoon she gave jimmy half a dozen soft pills and also a prescription for more it read sulphate of quinine one grain sulphate of iron two grains extract of hyoscyamus one grain with enough extract of teramaxcum and glycerin to make a pill it might be added that jimmy used this medicine faithfully and the sore itching spot at length disappeared from rags's back meanwhile the boys had arranged themselves expectantly on the front porch and the maid presently appeared with plates napkins sandwiches crullers and lemonade mrs hartshorn was a charming hostess and the boys waxed merry over their luncheon great piles of sandwiches disappeared as if by magic and then there was chocolate ice cream and sponge cake the dogs lay eyeing their masters enviously all except the incorrigible rags he sat up and begged constantly and even mrs hartshorn could not resist the temptation to toss him a morsel now and then which he caught with great deftness just as they were finishing mr hartshorn drove up in his car what have we here he cried an orphan asylum or a dog show he got out of his car and ascended the steps demanding his share of the luncheon those of the boys who had not already met him were introduced then he asked to be made acquainted with the dogs what do you think of them asked herbie pearson who was very proud of his imposing great dane i'll tell you after i've partaken of a little nourishment said mr hartshorn you can't expect a man to talk learnedly on an empty stomach can you he proceeded to do ample justice to his share of the sandwiches and ice cream while a jolly conversation was kept up even the shyer boys entering in at last now said mr hartshorn as he finished his last spoonful let's have a look at that great dane he stepped down from the porch and approached hamlet who submitted to his caress with dignity then mr hartshorn did strange things to him which brought a look of amazement into his eyes he pulled back the dog's hind feet and made him stand straight measured his head with his hands pulled down his lips and thumped his ribs 
a pretty good dog said mr hartshorn a trifle off in the shoulders perhaps and a bit cowhawk but he has a good head ever show him no sir said herbie well you ought to we'll see about that some time won't you tell us something about great danes and other dogs mr hartshorn asked harry barton things like you told us about the terriers the other day why said he i thought i must have given you such a dose of it the other time that you would want to run away from any more oh no sir said ernest whipple we thought it was very interesting we've talked it over a lot since and we want to know about all the other kinds of dogs too all the boys do well said mr hartshorn you never can tell what a boy will like i guess if you had to learn all that in school i bet you'd hate it but i don't want to overdo it i'll tell you about just a few this time the boys crowded around him expectantly as he sat down again on the porch the great dane he began though once a hunting dog a boarhound is now classed among the non-sporting breeds and i'll tell you something about those they include the very biggest dogs the mastiff the st bernard the newfoundland and the great dane the smaller ones are the english bulldog the french bulldog the chow chow the poodle the dalmatian and the shipperky the collies and other sheep dogs are also classed with the non-sporting breeds but i'll save those for another time let me get a book or two so that i'll be sure to get my information correct now then he continued when he had returned with his books i'll outline a few facts about each of these breeds but in order to avoid sounding like a walking catalogue i'm going to omit a good many things like color size and weight these things are very important in distinguishing the breeds but they aren't very easy to carry in your heads and you can find them all set down in the dog books i shall try to tell you only the interesting picturesque things about each breed's history and character and you can find all the rest in the books let's begin with the st bernard he's the biggest of all who knows anything about the st bernard there's a piece in the fourth reader about them ventured theron hammond they used to guide travelers in the alps and rescue them when they were lost in the snow and there was one named barry put in harry barton who saved the lives of forty people and they set up a monument of him in paris correct said mr hartshorn there's no breed more famed in song and story than the st bernard it was developed long ago by the monks of the hospice of st bernard in switzerland who trained their dogs for the purposes you have mentioned so many of them were lost however that the breed got into a bad way a hundred years ago and had to be brought back by crossing with the newfoundland and other breeds as i said it is one of the largest breeds sometimes weighing as much as two hundred pounds more than most men are there some good st bernard stories asked jack whipple who preferred anecdotes to descriptive particulars oh a lot of them said mr hartshorn but there seems to be a good deal of sameness about them they tell of the saving of alpine travellers and shepherds lost in snowstorms or caught in crevasses in glaciers some of them are very thrilling the best story i ever read about a st bernard however had nothing to do with mountaineering this dog was the beloved friend and constant companion of the count of monte vecchio a venetian nobleman now it became very necessary to the count that he should obtain certain favors from general morosini who was somewhat difficult of approach in spite of the fact that he was in much the same position himself in order to gain his own ends the general had arranged in his palace a gorgeous banquet in honour of the doge of venice from whom he hoped to gain important concessions and he had always caused his great banquet table to be laden with gold and silver plate and much fine venetian glass the count hearing of these preparations screwed up his courage and called on general morosini he praised to the skies the table appointments which pleased the general but as soon as he began to plead his own cause the general became cold and unyielding and begged the count to cease annoying him about these petty matters as the count left the general's palace he turned to his faithful dog with tears in his eyes and said you see my friend how badly i am used the st bernard was greatly affected by this and he formed in his own mind a plan of revenge since it was beyond his powers to secure justice 
unobserved he stole back into the general's palace and just as the doge was arriving with his retinue the dog seized the corner of the tablecloth in his mouth and dashed out of the house upsetting the whole banquet and smashing most of the valuable glassware i don't believe there is any moral to that story but perhaps that won't spoil it for you i don't believe i have any mastiff stories continued mr hartshorn but that breed must be mentioned in passing as it is one of the very old and very famous breeds of england the mastiff used to be popular here thirty years ago but we seldom see any now and sometimes i fear the breed is dying out it's too bad for he was a fine powerful dog brave and wise another fine dog that has gone out of fashion is the newfoundland there are still some good ones in england but very few here i suppose the newfoundland has more rescues of drowning persons to his credit than any other breed and it's a shame to see him go the breed originated on the island of newfoundland a hundred years ago and you will still see a dog's head on the newfoundland postage stamps the newfoundland has a waterproof coat and is a wonderful swimmer so that a good many of the anecdotes told about dogs of this breed have to do with their exploits in the water for example there is one of a man who fell off a narrow footbridge into a swift mill stream the miller's dog promptly dived in and rescued him and having accomplished this coolly plunged in again to save the man's hat that was just about to be swept over the dam there are several amusing stories told of newfoundlands dragging bathers to shore quite against their will because the dogs fancied they were in danger a naval lieutenant owned a canary bird and a newfoundland dog while they were cruising in the mediterranean the bird escaped from the cabin and flying out to sea became weighted down with the spray and dropped into the water the dog leaped overboard and when he was hauled up on deck again he dropped the bird out of his mouth quite uninjured another naval officer who owned a newfoundland was drowned when his ship was sunk near liverpool the faithful dog swam about over the spot for three days and three nights searching vainly for his master before he would allow himself to be brought exhausted to land friendships between two dogs are very rare but instances have been recorded and in most of these a newfoundland figures at donaghy there was once a mastiff and a newfoundland who were for some reason bitter enemies and as both were powerful dogs it was desirable to keep them apart one day however the mastiff attacked the newfoundland on the pier and a terrific fight ensued at length both dogs fell into the water and loosed their holes the newfoundland was soon on dry land but the mastiff was a poor swimmer and appeared in danger of drowning the newfoundland observing the plight of his recent antagonist plunged in again and brought him to shore after which the two dogs were the closest friends another newfoundland at cork became so annoyed by a small troublesome cur that at last he took him in his mouth and dropped him into the water when the small dog was nearly drowned the newfoundland rescued him and was never annoyed by him again but the newfoundland has been the means of saving not only drowning persons in eighteen forty one a labourer named rake in the parish of botley near southampton in england was buried in a gravel pit with two ribs broken he was helpless and would undoubtedly have died there if his employer's newfoundland dog had not dug him out william Ewett, who wrote two or three of the dog books in my library tells of an experience he once had with a friend's newfoundland dog named carlo Ewett and the friend and carlo parted on the road to kingston the dog and his master turning off towards wandsworth soon afterwards Ewett was accosted by ruffians he never knew what made carlo come back to him but the dog appeared at the critical moment and drove the men away carlo escorted Ewatt to a safe place and then in the author's quaint words with many a mutual and honest greeting we parted and he bounded away to overtake his rightful owner the newfoundland has always been famous as the protector of children and this is illustrated by an amusing story told of a newfoundland that was owned by the chief engineer on his majesty's ship buffalo the incident took place on an evening in eighteen fifty eight in the woolwich theatre in london 
in the third act of the play jesse veer there was a violent struggle over the possession of a child the dog who had sneaked into the theatre behind his master flew to the rescue across the footlights much to the consternation of all concerned my said ernest whipple there are certainly a fine lot of stories about newfoundlands are they all true well smiled mr hartshorn i can't vouch for them all but i believe that most of them are founded on fact and some of them are undoubtedly quite true now let's see what the next dog is the great dane is at the present time the most popular of the very large dogs as you can see by looking at hamlet he is a powerful graceful animal the breed was used in germany i don't know how long ago for hunting the wild boar and was introduced into england in the eighties as the german boarhound you can see from this one what kind of dog it is the ears are commonly cropped in this country but in eighteen ninety five the practice was abolished in england for all breeds i hope some day it will be abolished here the fanciers think cropping makes the dog look smarter but it's a silly unnatural thing to do when you come to think of it i wish i didn't have to do it with my bull terriers but they would never take prizes with long ears i don't remember any great dane stories now we come to the smaller ones mike here is a very good english bulldog though not so extreme a type as some of them this breed like the mastiff is of british origin and probably came from the same ancestry he was trained for bull baiting and later for pit fighting tramps and other people are afraid of bulldogs because of their frightful appearance but as you can see if you know mike they are often as gentle as lambs the french bulldog is much smaller and he is different in many respects he has big bat ears for one thing the chow chow is an interesting dog that comes from china perhaps you will be amazed when i tell you that this dog was originally bred and fattened by the chinese to be eaten like pork and mutton the tastes of the oriental are certainly peculiar the poodle which was originally a german dog but which was developed chiefly in france used to be better known than he is now he is supposed to be the cleverest of all dogs and you will usually find poodles in troops of trick dogs it seems to me said theron that i've read some stories about poodles yes there are a number of classic poodle stories said mr hartshorn illustrating the cleverness of the breed i am sorry to say that poodles have been trained as thieves dogs and have been widely used by smugglers on the french frontiers who trained them to carry lace and other valuable commodities across the border the most famous of these stories is that of the poodle of the pont neuf one of the bridges of paris he was owned by a boot black who taught him to roll in the mud of the seine and then run about among the pedestrians on the bridge dirtying their shoes this meant more business for the boot black an englishman observed this performance and was much impressed by the dog's smartness in carrying out his part he offered the boot black a good price for the poodle and took him back to london with him but the poodle didn't care for his new life apparently he had no wish to reform somehow or other he managed to stow himself away on a channel boat and made his way back to paris where he returned to his former master and resumed his old occupation when the boys had finished laughing over this droll story mr hartshorn continued the dalmatian or coach dog comes from eastern europe and was bred long ago in dalmatia now an austrian province he was well known in england by eighteen hundred and was used there as a stable dog and was trained to run with the horses and under the carriages here you will see him most often as mascots in fire engine houses it's queer how fashions run in those things he is always pure white evenly covered with round black or brown spots the last of this group is the shipperky i don't believe you know him for the breed isn't very common here the name means little skipper and the dog has long been a favorite with the captains of flemish and dutch canal barges the shipperky has no tail to wag there he concluded i guess i filled you up with enough dog information for this trip i don't want to overdo it you couldn't overdo it for me said ernest whipple will you tell us about some of the other breeds another day and tell us more anecdotes chimed in jack i promise said mr hartshorn 
ernest harry and theron were boys of the type that loved to collect facts and figures and they had recently been doing some reading on the subject of the breeds of dogs they discussed the matter all the way home becoming quite excited now and then over disputed points mr hartshorn said that rags didn't belong to any regular breed said jimmy rogers as the boys separated but i don't care there ought to be a breed like him anyway cause there isn't any better dog anywhere rags is good enough for me that's right cried the other boys in chorus you stick to rags he's all right whatever the books say good-bye rags so long jim End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of The Dogs of Boytown by Walter A. Dyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight Dog Days. By June, both Romulus and Remus were in full health again, and Mr. Whipple admitted that they began to look like real English setters. They were puppies still, full of fun and mischief, but their coats had lost some of their fuzzy, silky character, and their bodies had lengthened and filled out. They had gained a greater control over their muscles, and in their gambols about the yard they had acquired considerable speed. Sam Bumpus came down again to look at them, and pronounced them likely-looking youngsters. "'They got some growin' to do yet,' said he, "'but they're gainin' bone and speed every day, and the first thing you know you'll have two fine bird dogs, or I don't know what I'm talkin' about.' They also displayed increasing devotion to their masters, and had begun to develop, to a certain extent, the qualities of watchdogs. It was about this time that Jack Whipple made an extraordinary and alarming discovery. He noticed one day that Remus was having some sort of trouble with his mouth, as though he had perhaps got a piece of bone wedged in his teeth. He worked his jaws in a laughable manner and poked at them with his paw. Then he shook his head, ejected a small white object, and appeared relieved. Thinking it must be a piece of bone, Jack picked it up and examined it. It was a tooth. He called Ernest, and after poking about in Rome, they discovered another tooth in the sawdust beside the food dish. They proceeded to examine both dogs, and in Romulus's mouth they found another loose tooth, which came out in Ernest's fingers. "'Why,' cried Jack, "'they're losing all their teeth. How will they eat? How can they do anything?' Ernest was equally puzzled, and that evening they told their father about it. He also seemed perplexed. "'I'm afraid I can't help you,' he said. "'You'd better consult Tom Poultice or Sam Bumpus. Perhaps there's some disease that loosens dogs' teeth. Possibly it's the result of the distemper. I understand there are sometimes after-effects of that, such as deafness, and it may cause a dropping of the teeth. You'd better see about it before it goes any further.' The boys had been planning for some time to take the two dogs up to Sam's shack, since they now seemed old enough and strong enough to stand the journey, and it would be good fun for all concerned. So Ernest sent Sam word that they were coming, and on a bright, warm Saturday morning the four of them set out. The sky was clear and blue, a light breeze tempered the warmth of the brilliant sunshine, and it was a joy just to be alive and out in the open. The boys had their hands full, for Romulus and Remus had never before enjoyed so much liberty, and they did not always answer promptly the recalling whistle. The world, this great new world, seemed to hold so many sights and sounds and scents to interest a dog, that their impulse was to keep going and searching and never turn back. But it was a pleasure just to watch the zest with which they investigated every thicket and hillock. As they trotted along, twisting and doubling and turning, their noses held now high, sniffing the breeze, now close to the ground, they seemed to develop something of that lithe grace of movement that characterized the actions of their mother and old Nan. When they arrived at their destination, the dogs were at first much excited by the presence of so many others of their kind, but after a little while they were glad to take a long drink of water and to rest on the floor of the shack sam as usual was smiling and cordial oh, they're coming on they're coming on said he patting the young dogs and observing their sinewy limbs their sensitive nostrils and their soft intelligent eyes been teaching them to hunt on the way up the boys were forced to admit that they had made little progress with the vocational training of romulus and remus well there's plenty of time for that said sam they've got to get the sense of the fields and the woods first 
you get em so they'll come when they're called and a little later on i'll have time to take em in hand and teach em the fine points of the game how've they been anyway they're looking as sound as nuts they've been very well answered ernest except for one thing we don't know what's the trouble but their teeth are dropping out their teeth began sam and then burst into a roar of laughter in which the boys presently joined though they did not know why don't you worry about them teeth said he when he could speak again i bet it wasn't so very long ago that jack here had the very same trouble didn't you know that dogs lose their first teeth the same as boys do sure thing some folks are a good deal troubled about it and pull out the loose teeth for fear the dog will swallow em but it ain't likely to hurt em if they do just let em alone and nature will look out for em new and stronger teeth will go in their place and then they'll be fixed for life the boys relieved to find that the matter was not serious laughed again i guess this joke's on father too said ernest the trip to sam's shack was the first of a number of excursions thither which sam seemed to enjoy as much as the boys and the dogs and when vacation time came and every day was like saturday ernest and jack whipple came to understand better what it really means to have good dogs for constant companions it was in these days that visits to the swimming hole over by the brickyard began and romulus and remus were taught to enjoy the water as much as their masters did this swimming hole in fact proved to be the accepted meeting place for most of the boys and dogs of boytown for it became a regular practice for the boys to bring their dogs and to invent various aquatic sports in which the dogs played an important part old mike hated the water and could scarcely be induced to go in but much of the others entered into the spirit of the game with zest little alert proved to be a regular cork in the water and even huge hamlet splashed about in a dignified sort of way but the general favorite was rags he could dive for stones retrieve sticks and even stand up in the water with his forefeet pawing the air in a manner to bring laughter to the soberest and he had a way of devising sport of his own not always respecting the sanctity of the boy's clothing i don't know how it is with other boys but it is certain that the constant association with faithful four-footed comrades was good for the boys of boytown boys are often thoughtless to an extent that verges upon cruelty they love to tease and often find amusement in inventing new trials for a much enduring cat or dog but once let them get the idea of comradeship and protection firmly fixed and not infrequently a sort of chivalry appears to develop in their natures at least it was so with these boys they quarrelled and disputed and occasionally fought as boys will but there was no more torturing of animals and with this came less bullying of little boys and teasing of little girls each boy felt the responsibility of protecting his own beloved dog and with this came a sense of protection toward all animals mrs hammond theron's mother was wise enough to observe and take advantage of this and she organized the boys into a sort of humane society with meetings every two weeks and a set of rules and objects they were pledged to do what they could to see that no dumb animal was abused and more than once they were able to dissuade a brutal teamster from beating an overburdened horse in only one quarter did they totally fail dick wheaton would neither join the humane society nor would he mend his ways in regard to his treatment of jip but at least he never attempted to abuse any other animal whenever any of the boys were about after having received a good licking at the hands of jimmy rogers for annoying rags that taught him a much-needed lesson if every boy in america could be taught to be as kind to animals as these boys were and to interest himself personally in their treatment this would be a better world to live in so the summer vacation days passed with plenty of outdoor fun the boys forming an ever closer comradeship with their common interest and romulus and remus gaining in strength and wisdom every day for the most part they were healthy dogs and gave their masters little concern on that score though sometimes their tendency to get into mischief required attention for mrs whipple was not reconciled to their presence about her house and it was necessary to keep watch lest they offend beyond the chance of pardon the day they brought delia to the verge of tears by tearing a clean sheet from the clothesline and clashing with it about a muddy yard would have produced a disastrous crisis if mr whipple had not once more intervened 
once or twice the two dogs had to be doctored again for worms and in august came the pest of fleas this was a source of annoyance to both boys and dogs and mrs whipple when she found it out was in constant fear lest the insects be introduced into the house when ernest or jack discovered one on their own persons at night they left no stone unturned to capture and decapitate it as to the dogs they suffered not a little their long coats made a splendid breeding place for the parasites and they wore themselves thin with scratching fleas are not a pleasant thing to talk about but all dogs get them especially the long-haired kinds and not even frequent visits to the swimming hole will eradicate them it was sam bumpus who told the boys what to do about it one day when they were up to visit him he refused to let romulus and remus into the shack or near his kennels they're full of fleas said he as he watched the dogs scratching nervously and i don't want em to be droppin em around where my dogs will get em i have trouble enough with the varmints as it is you ought to get rid of em if you don't they'll hang on till november and the dogs will be no good for huntin well, how do we get rid of them asked ernest wash em in chrysolin or chrysolium or whatever your druggist wants to call it he'll know what you want when you tell him mix it with warm water and soap suds and scrub em good then rub em dry do it outdoors on the grass it's better than insect powder it won't kill all the eggs but it will drive the fleas off and if you keep at it and do it often enough you'll get rid of em all besides it gives the dogs some relief before the new ones can hatch better burn their beds once in a while too to kill the eggs in them the boys faithfully followed sam's instructions and were pleased to find the trouble greatly abated it was in august too that they took romulus and remus for their first trip to willowdale they were anxious to learn what mr and mrs hartshorn and tom poultice would think of their dogs and they were always glad of an excuse to visit the bull terriers and airedales and to listen to doggy talk luckily mr hartshorn was at home on this occasion though they paid their respects first to tom and the kennels before going up to the big house tom had not seen the two setters since they had recovered from the distemper and he was pleased to be frankly enthusiastic well i'll be blowed he exclaimed and are these the same two dogs that i doctored in your barn last spring they was sad enough looking pictures then the bally rascals they sure i've grown some i'd like nothing better than to take em out some day myself on a bit of a hunt look at the legs of em say you've got two fine bird dogs there naturally the boys were much pleased by tom's praise of their beloved dogs and they lingered for a time about the kennels while tom pointed out to them the fine points in a setter's action and explained how their graceful level gait enabled them to keep their noses out in front where they would catch the scent and at the same time cover rough country at high speed i have heard it said remarked tom that a hunting pointer can travel at the rate of eighteen miles an hour and keep it up for two or three hours and i guess a good setter's about as fast my exclaimed jack joyfully as they walked over to the house do you suppose we've got the two very best dogs in the world ernest well, i don't know said ernest maybe the ardor was cooled a trifle by mr hartshorn he examined romulus and remus in a minute judicial critical manner and discovered a number of technical points in which they fell short of perfection but he added they're mighty good dogs and you must remember that no dog is absolutely perfect from the show judge's standpoint and if these come from as fine a working strain as you have led me to believe it is remarkable that they should measure up so well by bench show standards some of the finest show champions are second-rate dogs in the field and some of the best hunting and field tried dogs don't win a yellow ribbon on the bench i should say that your dogs give promise of developing both working and show qualities to a marked degree and i shall watch their careers with great interest you have a brace of fine dogs there and no mistake whereat jack and ernest felt better you promised to tell us something about setters and other bird dogs ernest reminded him well said mr hartshorn i'm not so sure that i know so very much about them i used to do a little shooting years ago but your friend bumpus undoubtedly knows a lot more about the game than i do oh yes said ernest he does know a lot about hunting and training dogs but i mean about the breeds themselves their history and the sort of things you told us about some of the other breeds well said mr hartshorn i'll do the best i can the development of the setter is an interesting story but first we'll have to go back to the spaniels 
spaniels as you know are still classed as shooting or gun dogs and are used for that to some extent and the setter's ancestor was a spaniel the spaniel first came from spain or france and there are still many kinds on the continent of europe but the spaniel has been known for a long time in england too and the kinds we know here are those of british development mrs hartshorn has already told you about the english toy spaniels so i will omit those in the early days the breeds weren't divided up as they are today but were known as large and small land spaniels and water spaniels the oldest of the land spaniels of england now in existence is the sussex spaniel you won't see any in the united states i think the clumber spaniel you can see in our shows but he is also more popular among the sportsmen and fanciers of england than here he is the heaviest of the spaniels the cocker spaniel is the most popular kind in this country his name comes from the fact that he was used in england for many years for hunting woodcock he is smaller than the others the field spaniel is much like a large-sized cocker weighing about twice as much and finally there is the curly brown irish water spaniel which is really more closely related to the retriever and the poodle than to the other spaniels though spaniels are sporting dogs they have always been enjoyed quite as much for their companionship and they have an enviable reputation for fidelity there is a story told of a spaniel of the time of the french revolution which reminds me of greyfriars bobby this dog belonged to a magistrate who was condemned for conspiracy and was thrown into prison by means of his coaxing and pretty ways the spaniel at last won the heart of one of the jailers and managed to get in to his master he never left him after that even crouching between his knees when the magistrate was guillotined he followed the body to its burial and tried to dig into the grave obliged at last to abandon hope of ever seeing his master again he refused to eat and died at length of hunger and exposure on his master's grave another sad story of devotion is that of a spaniel belonging to the gamekeeper of the rev mr corsilius of wevenhoe essex england this dog's name was dash and he was his master's constant companion at night when he was able to render valuable service in helping to detect poachers when the old gamekeeper died nothing could persuade dash to accompany his successor on his rounds he divided his time between the grave and the room in which his master had died and at last he too died of a broken heart let me give you a more cheerful one before we pass on to the setters once when mrs grosvenor of richmond went to visit a relative who owned some pet cats she took her blenheim spaniel with her the cats who were selfish spoiled creatures were too many for the small spaniel and they succeeded in driving him out of the house but he refused to acknowledge defeat he proceeded to establish an alliance with the gardener's cat a big husky tom and when the time was right the two of them attacked and routed their common enemy after which the spaniel was let alone and now we come to the setters in some respects they are our finest gun dogs they came from one of the old land spaniels that was taught to crouch when finding game and they were called setting spaniels until about eighteen hundred since then the breed has been greatly improved there are three well-known varieties english irish and gordon all first-class dogs a man named laverick in shropshire england was the one who did the most to develop the english setter he bred them from eighteen twenty five to eighteen seventy five and produced the standard strain later a man named llewellyn promoted the strain and added new blood you will still hear the names laverick and llewellyn applied to different types of english setters this english variety is the most popular and numerous of the three i don't want to make any unpleasant comparisons but to my mind the irish setter is the handsomest of the family though as a sporting dog he does not rank with the english setter his shape is very nearly the same as that of the english setter but his coat is always a wonderful red-brown almost golden when the sun shines on it often very dark but with no black spots the gordon setter is the heaviest of the three and comes from a strain developed a century ago by the duke of richmond gordon a scotchman the color is always rich black and tan these are not the only bird dogs however 
there are the retrievers and the pointer besides some european breeds but i'm going to save them for another time i've got to get ready to catch a train now and besides i'm afraid of giving you this sort of information in too large a chunk mr hartshorn bade them good-bye and went upstairs the boys remained a few minutes longer with mrs hartshorn who had taken a great fancy to romulus and remus and then they set off for home in the hot sun of the afternoon End of chapter eight chapter nine of the dogs of boytown by walter a dyer this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the training of romulus on the way back from thornborough that day something happened that gave a new direction to the thoughts and aspirations of ernest and jack whipple they had gone somewhat out of their way to a woods road that was shadier and cooler than the highway and romulus was nosing and sniffing about in the underbrush quite a little distance to the left ernest whistled but romulus apparently did not hear he seemed to be darting about in the bushes with unusual eagerness what has he found do you suppose asked jack let's go and see said ernest the two boys and remus turned out of the road and approached the spot where romulus was hunting suddenly there was a whir of wings and a dark object flashed upward and disappeared among the trees for a moment romulus and remus both stood rigid with heads and tails outstretched then they broke and disappeared in the woods it was some little time before the boys could get them back again and started along the homeward road the boys breathless with running had not spoken to each other but now ernest said oh, it was some kind of bird jack did you notice yes said jack why ernest they know how to hunt already i guess it's instinct said ernest and did you see him point they really did for a minute just like sam's nan or the pictures in the books oh ernest cried jack we must take them hunting do you suppose we could sam could anyway said the older boy he said he'd train them the rest of the way home they talked of nothing but hunting and the wonderful achievements that were in store for the two dogs mr whipple approved the plan to have romulus and remus trained a good dog in his eyes was a dog that was good for something and he recognized the value of a well-trained bird dog though he had no desire to see the boys become too fond of hunting themselves all right said he take them up to bumpus and let him train them but you boys must promise not to ask to handle a gun yourselves you're not old enough for one thing and besides your mother doesn't approve of shooting it's a dangerous business at best remember now no nonsense about guns the boys willing to postpone that question till some future time readily promised and on a saturday morning in september soon after the reopening of school they took the dogs up to sam's shack remember said sam i ain't promising anything you never can tell what kind of a bird dog a setter will make till you've tried him out i've got a lot of other things to attend to this fall but i'll do the best i can and you mustn't be impatient if they ain't all finished off in two weeks now we'll take him out for their first lesson that first lesson proved to be a rather tedious affair to ernest and jack nothing was said about birds or guns pointing or retrieving sam's chief aim was to get the dogs to obey his word and whistle as well as they obeyed those of the boys and the latter were forced to keep silent while he gradually gained the mastery over the two lively young dogs sam displayed in this much greater patience than the boys did but still it was pleasant to be out in the fields this fine september day and to watch the dogs as they came to respond more and more readily to the commands of their trainer at first indeed there was but one command expressed by a sharp whistle or by the words come here boy sam seemed determined to add no further commands until he had secured unfailing and prompt obedience to this one but slow as the process was it was really remarkable what progress was made in a few short hours at noon they took the dogs back to the shack to enjoy a rest and a dry bone apiece while sam cooked and served a delicious luncheon of buckwheat cakes bacon and cocoa then after he had enjoyed a pipe or two and they had listened to some of his tales of dogs and hunting they started out again this time sam fastened a cord of good length to the dogs collars something they were not used to i'll need to use this later on said he and they've got to get used to the feel of it first 
they've got to learn to stand it without pulling and to answer the signals again he exhibited extraordinary patience for the dogs resented this unaccustomed restraint and seemed possessed to pull at their leads and try to break away it took a good two hours to break them to this simple harness then sam took it off and went all over the first lesson again which at first the dogs appeared to have forgotten well as the minister says here endeth the first lesson said sam when the shadows of late afternoon began to lengthen and they turned back again toward the shack the boys now realized that they were very tired do you think they'll ever learn asked jack uh, somewhat plaintively why sure said sam i've seen worse ones than these they're high-spirited as good dogs ought to be and a bit heady but they'll learn they've done very well so far still doubting but somewhat encouraged the boys prepared to take their departure in order that the training might go on uninterrupted it was necessary to leave romulus and remus in sam's care and it is a question which felt the worse about the separation the boys or the dogs ernest and jack knew that their pets would be in good hands and kindly treated but it was hard to say good-bye as for the dogs they set up a howling and crying when they found they were being deserted oh they'll soon get over that said sam they'll begin to take an interest in the other dogs pretty soon and then they'll feel more at home thus reassured the boys started off down the road without their four-footed comrades but the insistent wails that followed them were very heartrending, and two big tears rolled down jack's round cheeks and it was several days before they could get used to the desolate deserted look of rome or become reconciled to the absence of their playmates they could hardly wait for the next saturday to come when they could go up again to sam's shack and visit their beloved dogs romulus and remus were overjoyed at seeing them again and it was some time before sam could get them quieted down sufficiently to take them out for another lesson he had been training them during the week and the boys now heard him addressing them with strange words he placed their check cords on again and this time the dogs did not seem to resent it so much indeed they seemed to look upon it as the preliminary of a good time which as sam explained was the idea he had tried to impress on them hi on cried sam and the dog started off at a bound to ho he called this meant to stop abruptly and this command the dogs hoping for a good run did not obey so readily a quick tug at the check cord reminded them of the meaning of the command and soon they stopped more promptly at the words come in said sam and the dogs approached him charge said sam down after several attempts the dogs reluctantly obeyed and crouched at his feet heel he cried and after several repetitions of the order they took their places quietly behind him they're always a little slower the first thing in the morning sam explained before they've run off some of their deviltry they'll improve as they go along and improve they did in the afternoon sam took them out without the check cord and kept perseveringly at them until they would hie on and toho and charge and heel with reasonable promptness by next week i hope to show you something more said sam when will you shoot over them and teach them to point asked ernest oh not for some time yet said sam they gotta learn the a b c of it first next i will try to teach them to answer my hand first i'll call and wave at the same time and then just wave then they've got to learn to range to go whichever direction i want em to and turn when i want em to then i'll give em lessons in retrieving but before another saturday had come around sam had discovered something something which affected the whole future career of remus ernest and jack had duties to perform that saturday which engaged them the entire morning and they were unable to go up to sam's until afternoon their visit was consequently a short one and they had but little time to spend with sam in the field they found however that the training had been progressing satisfactorily sam was allowing the dogs to range in ever widening circles and on the whole they were obeying his commands in a promising manner they were beginning to retrieve objects also not as a hit or miss game after the manner of rags but in answer to the commands go fetch it and pick it up moreover the dogs were less homesick now that they had begun to take an interest in their occupations and to become acquainted with the other dogs 
they seemed to understand too that ernest and jack had not utterly deserted them but might be expected to appear at almost any moment but when it came time to go home sam detained them for a moment i've got to tell you something said he scratching his chin and looking a bit unhappy and i don't believe you'll like it much oh cried ernest can't you keep the dogs well, i can keep romulus said sam but i've got to ask you to take remus back i've given him every chance and i find he's hopeless as a bird dog he learns quick enough quicker than romulus if anything but he's got no nose none at all and a setter with no nose is about useless in the field it would be a waste of time to try to train him and when we got on the birds he would only get in romulus's way and spoil him so i guess you'll have to take him back and let me go ahead with the good one why what do you mean inquired jack struggling to hide his disappointment can't he smell oh i suppose he can tell spoiled fish when he gets it but he don't catch the scent of anything in the air i guess it was the distemper that did it he had it worse than romulus and it often spoils their noses when they have it hard enough i'm sorry but it can't be helped and it can't be cured for a few minutes jack stood silent pressing his lips together then suddenly he knelt down beside remus and hugged him passionately i don't care whether you've got a nose or not remus he cried i don't want to go hunting ever noses don't matter you're the best dog in the whole world anyhow and so they took remus back with them that afternoon leaving romulus behind howling mournfully for his brother such reports as they received from sam indicated that the training of romulus proceeded with fair rapidity during the fall they were not able to go up to his shack very often for one reason or another and jack at least was not so anxious to do so as he had been remus lived in solitary luxury in rome and was in some danger of being spoiled by the petting he received from his loyal master romulus so ernest learned could now retrieve at command and would bring back a dead pigeon or other bird without rumpling its feathers he would also range in obedience to a wave of sam's hand and was gradually learning to stand fast and hold his point when he flushed a covey of birds finally sam took out his gun to shoot over him and the rest of his training was to be chiefly that persistent practice which finally makes perfect it was decided that romulus should remain with sam until snow fell but one night there came a scratching and a whining at the door and a series of peculiar short little barks so persistently kept up that they awakened both the boys they slipped on their dressing gowns and slippers and stole downstairs at the door they found romulus with a broken bit of rope tied to his collar why cried jack it's romulus see he must have broken away he came all the way home alone in the dark said ernest how do you suppose he ever found his way romulus seemed to understand that it was not the time to make a noise for though he kept leaping on the boys in an excess of delight and making little sounds in his throat that were almost human he refrained from the loud joyous barking that he would have indulged in if it had been daytime remus had heard him however and was making a considerable commotion in rome so the boys took romulus quietly out to his brother who greeted him with paw and tongue and voice and bidding both dogs good night they went back to the house so it was decided that if romulus so much desired his own home he should be deprived of it no longer sam came down in a day or two to find out about it i thought he'd probably run home said he but i wanted to make sure i guess we'd better leave him here now i'm pretty near through with him for this fall anyway you just bring him up once in a while so i can take him out and not let him forget what i've learned him meanwhile the affairs of boytown were going on much as usual autumn passed in golden glory with nutting expeditions in october in which sometimes as many as a dozen boys and a dozen dogs joined forces as they started out through the town streets mr fellows the news dealer and stationer said it looked as though a circus had come to town such things however were of common and regular occurrence only two episodes of that season deserve to be especially recorded one was a dog fight which for a time brought the dog-owning fraternity of boytown into ill repute for some time several of the boys had been bragging as boys will about the prowess and battle of their particular dogs 
and this narrowed down at length to an unsettled controversy between monty hubbard and harry barton monty maintained that the irish terrier was the greatest daredevil and fighter in the canine world and he quoted books and individuals to prove it harry on the other hand insisted that the bulldog's grit and tenacity were proverbial and loudly asserted that if mike once got a grip on mr o'brien's throat it would be good-bye mr o'brien it is only fair to the boys to state that it was the irish terrier that started the fracas on his own initiative he was a scrappy terrier always ready to start something and it usually required considerable vigilance to keep him out of trouble but it must be confessed that on this particular occasion his master did not exert the usual restraint it happened out on the road that ernest and jack so often took when they visited sam bumpus or trapper's cave mr o'brien had been annoying the other dogs for some little time rushing and barking at them and inviting a friendly encounter he was not vicious but he loved a tussle finally mike the bulldog usually so long-suffering lost patience and turned on mr o'brien with a menacing snarl that seemed to mean business for a moment the irishman stood still in surprise while mike his head held low waited with a stubborn look in his eye that was clearly the time for interference but i regret to say that instead of interfering the boys grouped themselves about with feelings of not unpleasant anticipation i further regret to say that ernest whipple was one of the most interested suddenly mr o'brien recovering from his surprise returned to the attack with an impetuous rush which nearly bowled mike over but mike was heavier than mr o'brien and stood very solidly on his four outspread feet he merely turned about and presented a terrifying front to his more active antagonist again mr o'brien rushed seeking a hold on mike's big muscular neck for a time mr o'brien seemed to be having the best of it he took the offensive and seemed to be on all sides of mike at once the bulldog's ear was bleeding and harry urged him to retaliate suddenly mike raised his huge bulk and bore down the lighter dog beneath his weight then he began methodically seeking the vice-like hold that would have meant the last of mr o'brien just at that moment however a diversion occurred here there what are you doing demanded a man's hoarse voice and sam bumpus came striding out into the thick of it without the slightest fear or hesitation though such an act was decidedly not without danger he darted in and seized the dogs by their collars one in each hand and displaying wonderful strength of arm he dragged them apart if mike had succeeded in getting his hold if sam had come up a minute later he could not have done it as it was he held the snarling struggling dogs at arm's length shook them and then ordered their masters to take them in charge and keep them apart ernest had never seen sam angry before he was usually the embodiment of even-tempered good humor but he was angry now his jaws snapped and his eyes flashed and he seemed to be itching to give somebody a good spanking at last he spoke i thought you boys was fond of dogs he said i thought you made a great fuss about being kind to animals you ought to be ashamed of yourselves settin two good dogs on to fight each other don't you know no better dogs are built to fight and they ought to know how to when it's necessary but any man or boy that starts em fightin for sport is a coward without another word he turned and vanished into the woods the boys made no comments either and i am glad to say that most of them were about as ashamed of themselves as boys can be by common consent the afternoon expedition was abandoned and the company dispersed but that was not all of it the story of the dog fight leaked out and there was more than one home in boytown in which a boy was warned that if anything of that kind happened again there would be no more dogs in that family and monty hubbard received something even more impressive than a lecture mrs hammond when she heard of it was wise enough to say nothing until the matter had cooled down somewhat then she took occasion to set forth her views in a way that the boys never forgot and there was never another encouraged dog-fight in that town the other incident which i spoke of was the strange disappearance of romulus one morning he was gone and he did not return home all that day ernest searched for him in vain and went to bed that night with a very heavy heart 
the next day romulus did not appear nor the next acting on his father's advice ernest placed an advertisement in the paper and offered a reward but without result little by little ernest was forced to give up hope and a very disconsolate boy he was jack and remus did their best to console him but he grieved night and day no one could suggest what had become of romulus then on the evening of the fifth day a slight scratching was heard at the door and a low whine ernest who was studying his lessons heard it first dropping his book on the floor he rushed out closely followed by jack and mr whipple there lay romulus on the doormat all in as sam bumpus would have said he was so weak and weary that he could hardly rise and the wonder was that he had been able to drag himself home a piece of rope attached to his collar showed that he had broken loose from somewhere and bleeding feet testified to the distance he had come ernest lifted him in his arms and buried his face in the dog's shaggy coat and romulus responded as well as he could with a warm moist tongue and a wagging tail after they had given him a dinner of warm broth and had made him comfortable in rome mr whipple succeeded at last in dragging ernest away he'll be all right now said mr whipple he's exhausted but he'll soon recover from that he's a young dog you know but where could he have been wondered jack it's my belief that he was stolen said mr whipple someone who knew he was a valuable dog stole him but i doubt if we shall ever learn who it was but he must have been taken some distance away he looks as though he might have traveled thirty miles or more how do you suppose he ever found his way back asked jack mr whipple shook his head dogs are wonderful creatures said he End of chapter nine chapter ten of the dogs of boytown by walter a dyer this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten willowdale dogs in new york there are parts of connecticut in which winter is likely to be a rather moist and miserable season but boytown was situated in the hills where it was colder and drier it lay in the snow belt as mr whipple used to say consequently winter was for these boys a season which offered as many opportunities for outdoor sport as summer coasting skating and all the rest of it a favorite pastime with ernest and jack whipple was what they called snowshoeing they wore no snowshoes or skis to be sure but they pretended they did and they enjoyed trudging off over the snow-covered fields and through the woods with their dogs with their eyes ever on the alert for the tracks of birds and wild animals it was sam bumpus who taught them how to distinguish these tracks and whenever they found an unfamiliar one they took the news to him and learned what animal had made it he showed them where a flock of quail had spent the night in a close circle on the lee of a stone wall or a corn shock and he told them about the quail's interesting life history he showed them how some birds hop and some like the crow and the blackbird and the starling walk like a man or a chicken he taught them how to know the tracks of the squirrel the rabbit and the white-footed mouse and even the fox and the raccoon and one day he showed them where an owl's wings had brushed the snow when he swooped down to catch a mouse whose lacy little trail ended abruptly jack thought that was a sad little story for the snow to tell often they wanted no other object than merely to be out in the open with the constant possibility of finding rare tracks but sometimes they walked with the more definite purpose to take romulus up to sam's for a little training to refresh his memory or when a longer trip was possible to pay a visit to tom poultice and the hartshorns they were always welcome there it was on one of these visits in january that mr hartshorn made good his promise to tell them something about the breeds of gun dogs other than setters and spaniels i thought you must have forgotten about that said he what memories you youngsters have for some things well suppose we see how much we know about the pointer he is the dog you know that contests with the english setter the title of most popular and efficient gun dog i won't attempt to settle the matter each breed has its loyal advocates and in the field trials sometimes a pointer wins and sometimes a setter the pointer is a wonderfully symmetrical lithe athletic dog with remarkable nose bird sense and action 
like the setter he has been trained to point and retrieve he strains back to hound origin probably but was developed as a distinct breed in europe long ago doubtless with the help of setter and foxhound crosses some pointers are wonderfully staunch i know of one who held the same point without moving for an hour and a quarter while an artist painted his portrait and i once heard of one who caught a scent while halfway over a fence and hung there by his forepaws until the birds were flushed then there are several varieties of retrievers that are also bird dogs in this country we have the retrievers proper the labrador dog and the chesapeake bay dog though none of them are very common they are all probably of spaniel origin the labrador dog is supposed to have come from labrador but we don't know much about his history before eighteen fifty when he was introduced into england and was trained and used as a sporting dog the wavy-coated retriever called also the flat-coated retriever became popular among british sportsmen and fanciers about eighteen seventy he has a wavy coat longer than that of the labrador dog the curly-coated retriever less common in england than the wavy has seldom been shown here he is characterized by short crisp curls all over his body with the exception of the head strongly suggesting the presence of poodle or irish water spaniel blood in his make-up the chesapeake bay dog originated in maryland and possesses many of the traits of the retrievers he probably sprang from labrador ancestors crossed with tan-colored hounds finally we come to a very interesting dog one that you would love if you knew him the wire-haired pointing griffin he is a new dog with us but an old one in france holland belgium and germany he is a splendid bird dog useful for all kinds of game and a natural pointer and retriever he is medium-sized symmetrical and well built with a wiry coat and has a face something like an otter hound or an airedale and there you have all the prominent gun dogs what is an otter hound asked ernest mr hartshorn laughed you are insatiable said he some day i'll tell you about the otter hound and all the other members of the hound family but not to-day you've had enough it was partly the prospect of gaining information of this sort that made the trips to willowdale so attractive to the boys partly a genuine liking for mr and mrs hartshorn and partly the fun of talking with tom poultice and watching the airedales and bull terriers but more than all i think it was the home-like hospitable character and doggy atmosphere of the big house it was a place where everybody loved dogs and took as much interest in them as though they were people and where any dog lover was welcome consequently their visits there were more frequent than mrs whipple thought was quite proper you'll wear out your welcome she warned but somehow they didn't seem to it was during these winter days that they heard a good deal of talk about dog shows both from mr and mrs hartshorn and from tom poultice tom indeed was as much interested in the show dogs as if they had been his own and he was never tired of talking of their achievements on the bench and their possible future triumphs mr hartshorn owned a string of winners of both his breeds that were famous throughout the country and that included several great champions tom who nearly always took the dogs to the shows and stayed with them knew every little point about them as well as the points of their rivals of course it's a gloom and gamble he would say so much depends on whether your dog or the other one is the best condition that's why i've been doing so much fussin over em this winter you can't be too careful an upset stomach may mean a staring coat and may spoil a dog's chances and then again you may run up against a new judge with ideas of his own and then all your reckoning goes to smash it's a great game boys and so they were wont to go out to the kennels and watch tom grooming the dogs and listen to his wise talk about points and judging these were busy days for him for some of the biggest shows take place in the winter and the early spring and he had to keep the dogs in constant condition it was from tom that they learned the names of famous dogs of various breeds of instances when great champions had been beaten by unknown newcomers and of the rising and setting stars of dogdom but it was from mr hartshorn that they gained a clear idea of what a dog show was like 
he described to them the crowded halls the long rows of dogs of many breeds chained in little stalls on benches the arrangement of novice and puppy and limit and open classes for the different breeds and all the rest of it the dogs are taken to the show ring in classes said he and the judge for that breed sizes them up feels of them examines eyes teeth and hair compares posture and spirit and all the other things that count figures it all up according to a scale of points and then hands out ribbons to the winners a blue ribbon for first place a red one for second and a yellow one for third cash prizes go with the ribbons usually there are also special trophies for special winnings such as the best american bred dog of the breed or the best brace and there is the contest between the winners of the different classes in each breed finally in some of the big shows there is a special trophy for the best dog of any breed in the show this contest is usually held at the end of the show or perhaps before the packs of hounds and beagles are judged and is always an exciting time every exhibitor hopes to win one of the specials but most of the dogs are trying for their championship titles how do they win a championship asked ernest a dog becomes a champion answered mr hartshorn when he has won fifteen points in authorized shows these points are granted according to the size of the show at the biggest shows the winner of a first prize gets three points at the smaller shows where he has less competition he gets two points or one point an official record is kept of them all the new york show is the biggest of all isn't it asked ernest yes said mr hartshorn it is usually held in madison square garden in february four days including washington's birthday it's too long a time for the dogs to be benched but there are so many of them that it is impossible to get through the judging in less time sixteen or eighteen hundred dogs are shown there worth i don't know how many thousands of dollars and the crowds of spectators are big in proportion you get an idea at one of those shows how many people are interested in dogs the new york show is run by the westminster kennel club and because it's the biggest of all its trophies are greatly coveted the dog that is adjudged the best of all breeds in the new york show becomes the champion of champions of the united states oh my sighed jack i wish i could see a dog show like that you will some day said mr hartshorn and who knows but that you may have a dog benched there and carry away some blue ribbons and a silver cup anyway said ernest you'll tell us about this next one and what your dogs win won't you mr hartshorn you may depend upon that said he when the other boys learned what was afoot they all became mightily interested in the bench show game and in the prospects of the willowdale entries at new york one or two of them had subscribed to papers devoted to the dog fancy and these were handed about until the boys had familiarized themselves with the names of some of the old champions and the newer dogs of whom great things were expected heated discussions ensued but all were agreed in wishing luck to the willowdale dogs they were a bit disappointed when they learned that mr hartshorn had decided to send down only four of the bull terriers and five airedales but tom poultice explained the reason for this it cost five dollars for each entry of each dog and what's the use of entering dogs that don't stand a chance champion earl of norfolk is getting old and he's about out of coat and it wouldn't be fair to em to show em that way we picked the ones we're going to win with when mr and mrs hartshorn and tom polstice started out in the big car for new york with two of mrs hartshorn's palms on the back seat with her they were followed by the envious longings of most of the boys of boytown but the boys did not have to wait for their return to learn about the results of the judging they bought new york papers which reported the show fully and they devoured every word of the reports many of the familiar names appeared among the winners and the willowdale dogs captured their full share of the honors even mrs hartshorn's tip won two red ribbons while that splendid bull terrier willowdale's white hope was adjudged the best american bred dog of his breed exhibited by his breeder and gathered up enough extra points to secure his championship title but the climax in their rejoicing was reached when they read that the new airedale bingo's queen molly had gone right through her classes to reserve winners in an entry of over one hundred of the best airedales in the united states 
it was in short a great four days for willowdale the hartshorns returned on sunday having arranged for the shipment of the dogs on saturday and they graciously invited the whole gang up on the following saturday to admire the conquering heroes and their shining trophies and to learn all about what happened from the lips of mr and mrs hartshorn and tom poultice who by the way wore a grin that appeared to have become permanent didn't i tell you that molly was the genuine article was his frequently repeated comment it was unthinkable that after all this the boy should speedily lose interest on the contrary dog shows remained the foremost topic of conversation for a month until one day herbie pearson had an inspiration say fellers he exploded one morning bursting in upon a group of his friends in front of the schoolhouse let's get up a dog show of our own just then the bell rang which was rather unfortunate for all concerned the teachers found the boys strangely inattentive that day and preoccupied, and more than one of them had to be reprimanded for whispering or for passing notes. As soon as they obtained their freedom, they plunged at once into a discussion of Herbie's fascinating plan, and in an incredibly short time they had arranged the essential details. The Easter recess was selected as the most fitting time for the Boytown Dog Show, and a committee was appointed, consisting of Herbie Pearson, Harry Barton, and Ernest Whipple, to select a suitable place and make the necessary arrangements. After considerable discussion, it was decided that the Morton Barn would make an ideal show hall, provided they could gain Mr. Morton's consent it was one of the largest barns in the town proper and it was for the most part unoccupied mr morton having disposed of his horses when he bought his car mr morton was the president of the first national bank and a person of great dignity and importance of which the boys stood somewhat in awe but they had set their hearts on getting his barn and so they screwed up their courage and called on him at his home one afternoon after banking hours he turned out to be not such a formidable personage after all in fact he was amused by the diffidence of the delegation that called on him and even more amused when harry barton who had been chosen spokesman outlined their plan and suggested the use of his barn i'll let you hold your show in my barn on two conditions said he after asking several questions first you must promise to clean up thoroughly after it's all over second will you allow me to enter li hong chang in competition li hong chang was the blue-gray chow that followed at mr morton's heels wherever he went spent his days at the bank and never had a word to say to any other dog to this request the committee granted a ready and joyful request and it gave them another idea to invite the adult dog owners of boytown as well as the boys to exhibit their dogs a meeting of the humane society was called to receive the report of the committee's success and to arrange further details it was voted to charge an entrance fee of fifty cents for each dog shown and twenty-five cents admission for spectators the proceeds to be donated to the local chapter of the red cross of which mrs hammond was an active member since there were hardly two dogs in boytown of the same breed it did not seem possible to arrange for classes as in the big shows so it was decided to make it a free-for-all contest with first second and third prizes another committee was appointed to obtain these prizes from boytown merchants and to secure the services of mr hartshorn as judge mr hartshorn when approached on the matter quite readily gave his consent and the boys did not have great difficulty in obtaining the prizes when they explained that the show would be for the benefit of the red cross in fact mr pearson herbie's father who was a jeweller was unexpectedly generous he promised a silver cup for the first prize not a large one but real silver to be engraved later with the name of the show the date and the name of the winning dog the boys were so enthusiastically grateful for this that they expressed the hope that herbie's hamlet might win the trophy himself for six months past ernest whipple had been delivering evening papers for mr fellows the news dealer and had become quite a close friend of his employers this was due to the fact that mr fellows had once had a brindle bull terrier that had met an untimely death and whose memory ever remained fresh in his heart 
the dog's name had been bounce and mr fellows found in earnest a willing listener to his tales of bounce's sagacity courage and fidelity he was a genuine dog lover and enjoyed having ernest bring romulus in to see him for the boy's dog nearly always accompanied him on his paper route mr fellows had become much interested in the activities of the humane society and had become acquainted with most of the dogs of boytown and when ernest told him about the plan for a show he expressed a wish to have some part in it ernest was not a member of the prize committee but when he reported that mr fellows wished to donate a dog collar it was unanimously voted to accept it as second prize the third prize was a twenty-pound box of dog biscuit offered by mr dewey the grocer End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the dogs of boy town by walter a dyer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. The Boytown Dog Show The Boytown Dog Show was scheduled for Wednesday of Easter week, and the days preceding it were busy ones for the members of the Boytown Humane Society. They called on every owner of a dog in town, both boys and grown-ups, and succeeded in obtaining entry fees from a good proportion of them in the end they had twenty-six entries ranging from herbie pearson's great dane down to mrs peabody's little peak and they saw to it that every one of these dogs was benched on the day of the show on monday morning the citizens of boytown were amused to find tacked to trees billboards and telephone poles in different parts of the town a score or more homemade posters announcing the show and advertisements appeared in the local papers the posters were somewhat crudely done perhaps in red and black ink but they left no doubt as to their import and it is safe to say that there wasn't a single resident of boytown who did not soon know of the coming exhibition the posters read as follows boytown dog show morton's barn henry street wednesday april twelfth nine a m to five p m come and see the finest dogs in boytown twenty-six dogs twenty-one breeds first second and third prizes will be awarded to the best dogs mr merton hartshorn proprietor of the famous willowdale kennels will act as judge judging will begin at two thirty p m prizes will be awarded at four p m admission at twenty-five cents the proceeds will be given to the red cross the question of dick wheaton gave the boys a little trouble they didn't like dick he was not a member of the humane society and some of the boys thought he ought to be barred out because of his well-known disposition to be unkind to animals besides he had been openly making fun of the whole proceeding being divided in the matter they sought mrs hammond's advice i should let him enter jip if he will said she it can't do you any harm and it may help to get dick a little more interested in dogs and in the humane society besides it isn't dick that's going to be benched but jip and you haven't anything against jip put in that way it did seem unfair to bar out an unoffending dog who deserved nothing but sympathy just because his master was not popular so jib became one of the twenty-six mr hartshorn refused to consider bringing down any of his dogs and the boys were rather glad of that for it would hardly be a fair competition if the ordinary dogs of boytown were obliged to compete with the winners of willowdale it was too much like introducing professionals into an amateur contest besides said mr hartshorn it would be highly improper for a judge to have to judge his own dogs it isn't done you know so that matter was satisfactorily settled mrs hartshorn was invited to enter her toys but she declined on the ground that this was a boy's town show and they were thornboro dogs as for sam bumpus he said that a shoemaker had best stick to his last and that a trainer of gun dogs had no business to be mixing up with bench shows meanwhile the original committee had been busy getting the show hall into shape enough boards were obtained from here there and everywhere to make two long benches one along each side of the barn stoutly built and standing about two feet from the floor 
they were divided off by partitions into enough stalls to accommodate all the dogs entered and a coat of whitewash made the whole look clean and neat at the inner end of the barn the amateur carpenters erected a ring of posts connected by a rope this was where the judging was to take place finally a cashier's booth was made out of a large dry goods box and placed at the entrance and theron hammond was elected to stand there and receive the admission fees as he was the treasurer of the humane society frank stoddard who had no dog to show but who was as much interested as any of them was appointed to purchase tins for drinking water and to keep them filled during the show the last thing they placed cedar shavings from the planing mill in each of the stalls arranged hooks to fashion the leashes to and tacked to the wall above each place a card bearing the name breed and owner of the dog that was to occupy it so far as possible they arranged the dogs in accordance with their size when it came to rags's card they were a bit puzzled for mr hartshorn had told them that rags didn't belong to any recognized breed but it didn't seem fair to rags to leave the space blank so they invented a name for his breed wire-haired american terrier on the morning of the great show jack whipple awoke early and jumped out of bed ernest he cried and there was gloom in his voice what is it asked ernest sleepily it's raining said jack oh dear groaned ernest but they hurried through their breakfast nevertheless and taking romulus and remus they hastened down to morton's barn they found that the other members of the society were equally unafraid of a little rain but they were all a bit depressed the prospect for a successful show did not seem very bright however since all the arrangements had been made the boys decided that the only thing to do was to go ahead other exhibitors arrived some of them planning to spend the day with their pets but it was ten o'clock before theron hammond took in a single admission fee furthermore mrs peabody and one or two other timid exhibitors had failed to put in an appearance and special messengers had to be dispatched to fetch them it was just as well perhaps that the boys had this extra time to put on the finishing touches for the dogs were not used to this sort of confinement and made a good deal of trouble before they could be quieted then a special shelf had to be built for the display of the prizes the boys were so busy in fact that they hardly noticed that the rain had ceased about eleven o'clock theron gave a glad cry the sun's coming out he announced and here comes a gang of people from that time on the spectators arrived in a steady stream until the barn became quite crowded and the dogs were much excited the members of the society acted as ushers and entertained their visitors with more or less learned lectures on the different breeds and for the most part the spectators appeared to be hugely pleased with the whole performance boys and dogs included but the center of attraction turned out to be a dog that everyone knew didn't stand a show for even a third prize it was comical old rags he seemed to be enjoying the show more than anybody else in the place and to feel that the red cross needed his services as an entertainer he was ready with uplifted paw to greet every visitor that stopped in front of his bench and he never failed to bring a smile to the face of the least interested you couldn't see rags without loving him his eyes were so merry his smile so broad and warm his crooked ears so absurdly fascinating he got as much patting and petting that day as some dogs get in a lifetime and it seemed to him at least that a dog show was a most excellent kind of institution some of the dogs didn't take to it in so kindly a manner mr o'brien in fact became quite ill-tempered before the day was over to say that jimmy rogers was pleased is not overstating the truth he was prouder of rags than if he had won all the silver cups in christendom and he kept busy most of the day putting rags through his many tricks the boys went home to dinner in relays and by two o'clock the crowd was even larger they were curious to see what the judging would be like mr and mrs hartshorn and tom poultice arrived in the automobile and after they had inspected the dogs many of whom knew them mr hartshorn announced that the judging would begin 
ladies and gentlemen said he if you will kindly give me your attention and if monty hubbard will be good enough to sit on mr o'brien's head i will explain the manner in which the judging will be conducted when i call out the names the owners will please bring their dogs to the ring i will inspect them in groups of five i will take a note of the best dogs in these groups and will then ask to see some of them a second time in order to determine for certain which are in my judgment the best dogs beginning with hamlet he called for the first five dogs in the row and proceeded thus until in the last group six dogs were judged he went at it in a business-like manner examining each dog carefully and making jottings in a notebook when asked about his basis for judging the dogs he promised to explain that when he announced the winners each owner held his or her own dog in the ring making him walk past the judge when so requested and it all went smoothly until the third group came to be judged then before anyone knew what had happened the overwrought mr o'brien had made an angry lunge at li hong chang and there was something doing in the show ring the chow was not lacking in courage and returned the attack while the other three dogs struggled vainly to mix in some of the ladies in the audience screamed and it required the combined efforts of mr hartshorn mr morton tom poultice and monty hubbard to separate the antagonists and straighten things out again mr o'brien was unsatisfied and snarled ominously but it made him look all the more spirited during the judging after that there were no untoward events to mar the occasion by the time mr hartshorn had had some of the dogs up a second and even a third time it was nearly four o'clock the hour set for announcing the winners the place was crowded now and not a little speculation was heard as to the judges probable decisions among the boys at least this interest in the outcome amounted to tense excitement in which some of the grown-ups were not ashamed to share at length mr hartshorn came to the rope and addressed the gathering ladies and gentlemen said he you are all waiting i know to learn the names of the winning dogs but first i think i ought to offer a few words of explanation let me say that we have some very good dogs here to-day they might not measure up to the standard set in the big shows but they are very good representatives of the various breeds since it is necessary to compare dogs of different breeds instead of dogs of the same breed in judging it is not altogether easy to reach a decision on comparative merits i can only rely upon my best judgment and will ask you to be indulgent with me in case you do not agree with my choice in judging dogs at a show we do not take into consideration the personal character or intelligence of a dog but chiefly his physical characteristics he must not appear stupid and he must show the qualities of character attributed to his breed a sleepy terrier for instance cannot win in a show beyond that however it is a matter of what is called type authorities have carefully gone over the points that are typical of each breed and have written them out in what are called the standards winning dogs must conform very largely to the type described in the standard and the more of the established points he can show in perfect form the higher will be his score in selecting his position among the winners i cannot take your time to describe all these points in each case but simply state that my judging is on that basis it is an arbitrary method i grant you and there are good people who protest against judging dogs in accordance with their physical features not taking into account the qualities of heart and brain that we really care for in a dog but that is the fancier's way of getting at it if we did not have arbitrary and approved standards to work upon in breeding every breeder would work out his own personal ideas and we would have a strange assortment of sizes and shapes and no predominant type in any breed it is the work of the fanciers that has produced the marked differences between the breeds and that keeps them from degenerating into a sorry lot of mixed mongrels until we should not be able to tell a collie from a saint bernard i trust that this brief explanation will give you an idea of the basis of my judgment in this show i have given the preference not to the wisest and most capable and most affectionate dogs but to those that most nearly approach the approved standards of their breeds i will now ask to have the following dogs brought to the ring 
mr sanderson's german shepherd dog rupert of hentau mrs peabody's pekingese spaniel chi yin herbert pearson's great dane hamlet harry barton's english bulldog mike montague hubbard's irish terrier mr o'brien keep him on a short leash monty jack whipple's english setter remus all of these dogs have been previously mentioned except rupert both he and his master were newcomers in boytown and the big strong active dog with his wolfish look his erect ears and his brave bright eyes had attracted a good deal of attention at the show when the six dogs had been brought again into the ring mr hartshorn continued his discourse i believe said he that all of these dogs should receive honourable mention or as we call it at the shows the v h c very highly commended they all possess points of excellence but all fall short in some particulars rupert of hensau looks like a perfect dog but if you were to compare him with the best of his breed you would see that he is a little too short in the head too flat-sided and too leggy chi yin measures up pretty well but she hasn't a good color and her coat isn't quite as profuse as it should be hamlet's feet and ankles are bad this is often the case with big dogs that grew fast when they were puppies their bones do not strengthen fast enough to bear their increasing weight and the result is apt to be flat feet turning out and bent ankles hamlet is a bit thin too but is otherwise a good dane in the english bulldog classes the preference is generally given to the extreme types a dog with wider elbows deeper chest and a heavier jaw would beat mike easily mr o'brien has irish terrier character aplenty but he is a bit too large and coarse as the expression is and his coat is too long and soft and too light in color remus will make a fine dog some day i believe but he has had hard luck thus far and he hasn't grown up quite evenly he needs strengthening in the shoulders and he is out of coat his tail is a bit stringy with proper care i believe these defects can be obviated i take pleasure in conferring the v h c on these six dogs they were led out of the ring amid the applause of the spectators which somewhat softened the disappointment of their owners in not taking prizes when mr hartshorn called for the three dogs that were to receive the honors of the show the applause increased in answer to their names theron hammond ernest whipple and dick wheaton brought their dogs proudly to the ring mr hartshorn took the handsome silver cup from its shelf and held it up where all might see it gives me great pleasure he announced to confer the first prize upon alert boston terrier owned by theron hammond theron stepped forward blushing violently and smiling broadly and took the trophy from the hands of the judge then he stooped down impulsively and picked alert up hugging him in his arms to which demonstration alert replied by gently chewing his master's ear when the hand clapping had died down mr hartshorn continued i will not spoil this triumph by pointing out alert's defects he would very likely meet his superiors in one of the big shows for the boston terrier entries are always very large but i don't think he would be entirely out of the running in a novice class i understand he is a registered and pedigreed dog and he certainly shows evidences of good breeding in my judgment he comes closer to his breed's standard than any other dog in this show the second prize this handsome dog collar is won by romulus english setter owned by ernest whipple he is a litter brother of remus but he is better developed and has a better coat he is a first-class specimen of the llewellyn type and though there are a few points in which he falls below the strict bench show standard he is a splendid setter the third prize which will perhaps be better appreciated by its recipient than any of the others is a box of dog biscuit i hope however that it will not form his sole diet as he is doubtless accustomed to a more varied and palatable menu the prize is won by gypsy smooth fox terrier owned by richard wheaton gyp is a little off type in some respects but i have decided that according to my score of points he is the third best dog in the show 
mr hartshorn bowed and withdrew while mrs hartshorn remarked to a friend that she didn't believe he had ever made such a long speech before in his life the spectators crowded around the winners to congratulate the three boys and to pat and admire their dogs more than one person in that barn had his or her eyes opened that day for the first time to the points of excellence of dog flesh still there were some who stepped back to the bench where rag sat an uncomprehending spectator and assured him that he was the best dog in the show after all and that he would have received the silver cup if they had been the judges ernest and theron had never known a happier day of triumph and even dick wheaton who had received his prize with a supercilious smile appeared to be a bit softened for the time being and to show some pride in his ownership of the much abused jip there were indeed some heart burnings among the losers herbie pearson for one had had high hopes of hamlet but they had all agreed to accept the outcome like good sports and they could not remain long despondent in the face of the success of their show as for jack whipple the youngest exhibitor of all he displayed a spirit that the others would have been ashamed not to follow he was frankly pleased at the success of romulus and stoutly asserted that remus would have his big day yet mr fellows was as much pleased as ernest was and privately confided to him that he was glad romulus didn't get first prize as he would have been disappointed to see any other dog wearing that collar the people were beginning to file out of the barn after a final tour of the benches when mr hartshorn standing beside the cashier's booth once more called for order as you know he said in his strong voice the proceeds of this show are to be given to the red cross and you may be interested to learn just how much has been netted for that good cause by today's unique effort on the part of the boy town humane society the treasurer theron hammond has been busy with arithmetic for the past twenty minutes and has an announcement to make theron was suddenly stricken with stage fright but he did not attempt to make a speech he merely read the figures of his report entry fees for twenty-six dogs he read thirteen dollars attendance two hundred and forty-two gate receipts sixty dollars and fifty cents total receipts seventy three dollars and fifty cents advertising eight dollars other expenses two dollars and sixty seven cents total expense ten dollars and sixty seven cents net proceeds sixty two dollars and eighty three cents i wonder remarked mr hartshorn to his wife if a dozen women could knit sixty two dollars and eighty three cents worth of mufflers in one day the exhibitors began taking their weary dogs home and the boys started the cleaning up process that was part of their bargain with mr morton and so the great day ended the fly in the ointment of ernest and jack whipple was the fact that although their father had been an enthusiastic spectator throughout the greater part of the afternoon their mother had not seen fit to attend she was very busy she said and anyway dogs did not particularly interest her next morning the two local papers contained full accounts of the show to the extent of a column or more and they treated it as one of the season's events of boytown giving the names of all the dogs and their owners and a complete report of the awards besides the treasurer's report one of them even published an editorial praising the work of the humane society and suggesting that the town should be proud of its boys and its dogs mr whipple and the boys devoured the contents of these papers eagerly before breakfast after breakfast they found mrs whipple reading one of them in the sitting-room what are you reading mother asked mr whipple but she was so absorbed that she did not answer for a time at length she murmured half to herself hm mm, i don't see yet why remus didn't get a prize whereat it must be related mr whipple turned and winked at the boys in a most undignified manner End of chapter eleven